You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your truth sayer host, Abraham. And I am your flat earther host, Shane. We do oh, this on no. the fly, by the way. So we, <laughs> I was not expecting Shane to be a flat earther, but apparently we arrived there just on a whim. To be fair, Shaquille O'Neal, who has a doctorate, has said that, you know, flat earth is just a theory. So it's worth considering, which, uh, you know, disagree. This is the timeline we're in now. Yeah. False. Incorrect. <laughs> Sha- Shaq should go back to playing basketball and also making delicious, delicious soda with Arizona. Is he from Florida? Because so. that might explain that. I don't know if he's from Florida, but he played basketball in Florida for a very long time. Okay. All right. So that's influenced one way or another. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> steep, we're not a basketball podcast. Uh, <laughs> not yet. Or a sports history podcast. We're actually a psychology <laughs> podcast, believe it or not. Uh-huh. So we like to talk about human behavior and related type topics. And uh, today we are following up with a second part, following our first part in a discussion about the difference, the important distinction between skepticism and denialism. Yes. And so I do strongly encourage, if you have not heard that first episode, to go back and listen to that. We'll do a quick summary uh, so that you're at least caught up, but that one does set a good press, you know, uh, stage for understanding what we're going to be expanding upon in this episode. And this one is, in my opinion, this is the, the one of the juicy, this is the juicy part right here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. So for those of you who have not heard, the basic thing is skepticism is that we don't trust everything as a singular truth. With new information, we change our ideas about the world. That's kind of like the gist of it. And then denialism is basically, I've got this information. But the answer is no, that's not true. And that's why we have flat earthers and Marjorie Taylor Greene. Yes, that is a good summary. And I will will actually, I think I will expand on that summary. But I also want to acknowledge the day of the year that it is and that there are some holidays or things that are like holidays to celebrate with that. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so apparently... September is a month of all the things. This is the most I've ever seen <laughs> since we started talking about this in one place. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. I'm going to try and narrow down and, and sort of cherry pick a few. First, we'll begin with this is our first episode releasing in September. And September is National Suicide Prevention Month. And I think that is a very important topic. Yes, agreed. It is also... And very in keeping with, I think, Shane and and myself, but I feel like this is a characteristic of Shane. It is National Read a Book Month. I mean, read more than a book, but like if you need to start somewhere, at least one book is a good place to start. (laughs) Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I think this is it'll be read 30 books for Shane. (laughs) Yeah, probably. um, (laughs) It is also National Piano Month, Sourdough September, and I'll also leave it on National Mushroom Month. So these are all September related things. And maybe I'll share a few more of the September month things as we do episodes in September. But those are some to highlight at the top. Yeah, some fun stuff. National Mushroom Month is is fun, too. Yeah. Uh, Apparently, they all communicate with one another, all the mushrooms. And with us psychically. So I like it. (laughs) Now, this comes out on September 7th, and September 7th is National Acorn Squash Day. A good one. It is, in keeping with the theme of the month, National Buy a Book Day. Go buy one. Absolutely. It is also Superhuman Day, which has to do with the Paralympics. I like that. And finally, I will shout out the National Beer Lovers Day. So, you should go watch the We Are the Superhumans documentary uh, about the Paralympics while drinking some beer after buying a book about Pure Olympics and maybe snacking on some acorn squash. And then that'll, that'll just situate you squarely for a celebration. That's a really good day, it sounds like. Whew, that was a lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah, yeah seriously. September's a busy month. Now, we're also going to jump into uh, finishing up our recap, but I'll also say if you do uh, support the show or you want to support the show, you can still, uh, rate and subscribe, leave us a review, join us on Patreon, buy some merch, send us a donation, come be a fan groupy person somewhere. yes please do <laughs> all those things all the support in the world helps so yes yeah exactly um all in the world anything less than that and you're doing nothing just kidding mm-hmm. yeah exactly <laughs> so last time as, as shane mentioned we were talking about the difference between skepticism and denialism and one of those being that with denialism you are essentially and you're it is a belief in something that is directly contrary to the available evidence mm-hmm. and the where skepticism is instead as you said very eloquently i think a sort of a you are accepting a 
amount of evidence that informs a position and that that is a position that is refined and changed over time to meet new evidence. Yes, exactly. That's the way that I would approach it. There's other things about this, which is just that one of the problems in this is that skepticism and denialism are playing very different games with respect to how they influence people and how they show up in the world. And unfortunately, the only thing that denialism really needs to survive and thrive is to exist at all. It just needs mm-hmm. to, to spread seeds of doubt. And if it does that, then it is being victorious in some capacity. Unfortunately. Yeah, very unfortunately. Also, we sort of moved into the point. Uh, the last, last thing I mentioned from our, our previous discussion is that denialism has sort of shifted. It is now turning into where it used to be sort of a, a carefully scripted development of a sort of counter hypothesis to mainstream ideas. It has really shifted into a wholesale chaos rejection of anything resembling facts. And instead, anything goes sort of yes. world. It's just sort of a free for all. Any any idea that's thrown out there is given equal weight, no matter how absolutely bonkers it is. Right. Well, alternative facts is a symptom of a result of denialism. Like when people say alternative facts or yes. fake news like that is that is just the rhetoric that is used by denialists to allow people to question f- truths that we know or facts that we know about the universe. I mean, that's why you end up with flat earthers and anti-vaxxers and all those situations on like kind of a global grand scale. Right. Right. You end up with with people in like this mass kind of exodus away from science and towards nonsense. And it's because of stuff like that, like those really quick and easy those those hot button statements those quotes those phrases yeah. that are true kind of like denialist flying their flag yeah yeah basically they communicate in these sound bites that are just meant to stoke fear and anger and hatred and anxiety and that sort of thing and and then people mm-hmm. feed off that yep absolutely is there anything else to say about last episode before we dive in today's topic no i think i think i think we said all we needed to say in the last episode all right, perfect. All right, well, we're we're already a good chunk of the way into this this, uh, <laughs> this this episode so far. So let's let's go ahead and get started and talking about why do people do this denialism thing? What gets them yeah. there? Right. So the motivation for why people engage in denialism is wildly varied. We've got a somewhat inferable type of you know information from the denial itself, and we have to kind of ask the question. What do people gain out of this? And specifically, we're going to kind of talk about this, about the 2020 election, right? So what does someone gain by believing that the U.S. 2020 election was rigged? What do they get out of that? Possibly a lot. (laughs) Politicians who espouse this position gain political favor from Trump and his supporters. Lawmakers can use this argument to pass voting legislation to install, quote unquote, officials or fake electors in positions that all but guarantee that they can choose the outcome of elections indefinitely. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's both a power grab and a political favor currying move yeah. that is gained by, but so that's always an important part here. Sort of follow the money. Yeah. The people whose candidate didn't win are actually confronting a reality that the other candidate actually won and they're conceding that they don't value the democratic process. Right. So they're basically saying like, hey, you didn't win. That's bogus. The election was fake. And they're basically kind of undermining the democratic process as it is. Right. And so, again, we're sort of the denialist position reveals some of the motives. So let's let's also turn to a looking at something like climate change. Right. Mm -hmm. The climate change denialists who claim that climate change isn't happening or isn't human caused are essentially implying in a way that if it were real and were human caused, it would be a problem. Right. Because they're right. they're sort of saying like that, that can't be if it was, then we'd be in real trouble. Right. Right. And that that would mean that something would have to be done or instead that they legitimately don't care about this planet or the people on it. Like that's that's kind of what's implied by that. Right. Is that if we accept that this is a reality, we have to accept that things are bad or else admit that we don't want the human species to survive very long here. Yeah. And and you see kind of a, a same type of motivation or argument with vaccine deniers, right? So vaccine deniers are implicitly 
claiming that disease and its complications, including death, is actually better than listening to or accepting the words of experts. Or they're taking other information that is just simply not true, and they're trusting different experts than the actual experts, which I always thought that was a really fascinating thing. It's like they'll trust they'll trust a crystal expert, but they won't trust somebody who actually studies vaccines because of different types of false facts that they might have pulled. Yeah. And I, I believe that I mentioned this later, but if I don't, I'll say just a small version of it now, which is you're exactly right. There is this kind of ironic position that a mountain of evidence is insufficient to convince them of the position, but the tiniest shred of an anecdote of hearsay is more than enough evidence to convince them of their position, yeah. right? Yeah. So the, the evidence itself is actually not important or of value. It's just, you know, who's saying what I like to hear, and that's mm-hmm. the person I'll believe sort of yep. position. It's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. So I think In short here, when we're talking about the motives, why do people do this? That sort of thing. I mean, going back to the original quote that we gave at the top of the last episode, which I think Bear is repeating here by Upton Sinclair, the quote is, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it, end quote. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so, yeah, I think basically what that leaves us with is some people are paid to be deniers, but... With respect to the others, because there are many who are just influenced, some people just don't want to accept uncomfortable or inconvenient evidence. Mm -hmm. Some people are just easily persuaded. But many people are essentially confronting the fact that they have radically and diametrically opposed morals and values to what you might consider sort of common mainstream culture and values and, and that sort of thing. And if they were hiding behind denialism in that space, their motivations would be incredibly transparent and we would have a whole different set of issues. Right. So on one side, people whose actions and values are the preservation and success of the human species. We've got the other side where people whose motivations range from selfish, immediate gratification to flagrant racism, hate apocalyptic chaos, all the other fun stuff that goes along with it. So it is a lot of just basically conflicting morals and values, and people just have a hard time just saying that out loud. And not necessarily knowing, like, what it would be a good thing if they were saying it out loud, because we've seen that, like, the the move to violently open bigotry mm-hmm. that has happened in the last several years in the United States specifically, and in many other parts of the world, actually. Right. I don't know. Like, it seems like it. what it mostly did was help that movement gain momentum and followers. Yeah. But it did also expose it, which I think there was many of us who were living in the dark about how bad of a problem it was. So I, I feel like there's two arguments there to be made. Oh, absolutely. 100%. So before we talk about how they actually do it, we should talk about how some products are really good for you and how you should purchase them. So we're going to take a quick ad break and we'll be back in a second. All right. Hopefully those uh, ads were good for you, too. Let's get into how denialism works, sort of what are the rhetorical devices that manipulate people into accepting or at least drifting toward the denialist position. Right. And I will preface this by saying that we use the skeptics guide to the universe book as to inform part of this discussion. And I did borrow heavily from that book for talking about the sort of tactics here. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in reading more about that, I, I recommend you go check out that book. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. So denialism starts with the desired outcome and then works backwards from there. So, for example, a denialist starts with the U.S. terrorist attack on the Twin Towers in New York on 9-11, and they'll start with the idea that it was a hoax. And then what will happen is any and all routes that end are viable, right? The attacks didn't happen. They did happen, but the planes were empty. The planes did hit the towers, but they only fell because of controlled demolition. And you could tell because several floors below started to show signs of giving out before the floors with the planes started to collapse because someone said that they heard detonations in the building because jet fuel doesn't burn hot enough to cripple the building's infrastructure. The government orchestrated the attacks the whole thing was a special effects film and none of it was real etc 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 you can see kind of how it can spiral and those gaps get filled with information that doesn't exist and what was fun about that sort of rant that you went on is how many times like it sounded like a coherent string of of words like yeah every contained phrase that you uttered was 
perfectly understandable and completely contradicted the phrase before it. Like, yes. <laughs> and that's kind of what we're dealing with here is like that, that people figured out that they could do that and that denialists are perfectly happy to accept that kind of rhetoric in the chaotic world we find ourselves. Right. But there are some other specific denialist sort of tactics. One of them being a sort of, you know, start with your conclusion, then look for justifications for being right. And right. then it, it doesn't like anything that could possibly make coherent sense to you at that point becomes viable as an explanation. Right. Which I well to, to, to that point, I want to make this really clear. Scientists do a similar thing in that, but but not similar in the process, right? So instead of Starting with a solution, they start with a question that they're trying to answer. Right. And so denialists will start with a sol- with an end point. They'll start with an answer and then fill in the blanks that lead to that answer. And that's a huge difference. I love that you said that, too, because you're exactly right, is that the scientists start with a question and then try and figure out how to find answers to that question. The denialist starts with the answer and then tries to find questions that justify that answer. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a very different process. But, um, you know, science rules. So <laughs> it does. And speaking of what you were just describing, that actually leads us to one of the first tactics to discuss with respect to how denialists influence people. And that is what we, what you might call the I'm just asking questions approach. Lots of <laughs> yeah. scare quotes going on. I know this is not a visual yeah. medium, but I'm doing that. And so, yeah, the just asking questions tactic, this is meant to manufacture and exaggerate doubt by making a claim appear to be controversial. Yeah, so this is like a really insidious way that denialism works because science is never 100% certain. And if you go read the book Bad Advice by Paul Offit, he talks about that and the difficulties of making extraordinary claims in the name of science because you can't ever make a 100% claim. So by definition, uh, you know, that's what science is. But deniers use that 0.01% of unwillingness to claim certainty by scientists to say, quote, isn't it possible that the science is wrong and instead it, it is blank or X or something like that? So deniers will say that like, but couldn't science be wrong? It's like, well, yes. And scientists have to concede. Yes, science right. could be wrong. And that's why it's science. But the possibility that it is X uh, or the X that they want is so vanishingly small, the chance that it's it's childish to pursue it. It's not a question that we need answered. It's not something that needs to be. It's it's pretty much been ruled out through the process of science. But they're still asking that question to kind of sow the seeds of doubt. You know, an aspect of that is that while science is never 100 percent certain, denialists are always 100 percent certain. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so when the just asking questions approach provides quote unquote counter evidence, it's usually in the form of more questions. As I said, they're sort of they start with the answer and then find questions and make it seem like they're pursuing it. And it's usually a lot of logical fallacies. And I feel like the sea lioning thing we've described on other episodes falls into this category. And so sea lioning, just as a quick refresher, is a way of delivering an argument by asking a bunch of rhetorical questions in bad faith that makes it seem like you're asking legitimate questions, even though they're often questions that you have the information that you don't even right. believe the implication of the question that you're offering. It is setting up a straw man, that sort of thing. So it's like, why isn't this explained better? Why aren't they talking about this? And why isn't that the case? I'm like, they are, it is, it, they do, it does. Like all of those <laughs> yes. are like the answers. To those questions are blatantly obvious and easy to find answers to. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Now, another tactic that you'll see is moving the goalpost. And so this happens all the time. I see this happen with flat earthers so much. It's like they'll like something will be disproved and it'll be like, whoa, 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 whoa wait, but this is that. And I'm actually trying to prove yeah, this yeah. and so on and so forth. And it'll kind of go right. on. Definitely. Yeah. And there's a really good episode of Futurama that does this. That's one of my favorites where it's actually funny. There's like a talking ape or chimpanzee or something that is debating with professor farnsworth I mean, the ape is like a creationist and farnsworth is obviously espousing an evolution position and the ape keeps saying like well what about this missing link you haven't found that and then farnsworth says yes we did it's this we found it and this is its characteristics and the ape says well what about this miss like aha that proves my point because what about this missing link and farnsworth says oh we found that one too and this is it and the ape says well i've got you there because what about this missing link and they just keep going back and filling in and they like skip yeah. forward and there's like 30 times that they've gone through this debate <laughs> until finally there's like the one missing link and that Farnsworth is like, all right, you, you got me there, but just because we don't have it yet doesn't mean we're never going to right? <laughs> <laughs> like that's an exact, exact sort of demonstration of that. 
Right. And that's basically the strategy. So what ends up happening is in denialism, the denialist will ask for evidence. And then when that evidence is supplied or presented, they want more evidence. And then that evidence is supplied and they want more evidence. And essentially what ends up happening is more evidence doesn't actually change the mind of the denier. They only want evidence to support their view. And anything is insufficient. Anything that you provide is insufficient. And then that small gap, that small, like that little bit of uncertainty is enough for them to glom on to and be like, see, and like just like you mentioned in that skit, it, that's exactly yeah. what it is. See, I told you there was a missing link. I told you this can't be one hundred percent true. And it's like I never said it was one hundred percent true, but we have evidence to support that we are like ninety nine percent there. Yeah, and all of the all the progress we made along the way supports the fact that there is very likely the next piece of evidence just around the corner. Right. Because like we kept filling in the gaps and filling in the gaps and filling in the gaps, and like it's only a matter of time before we're there. Right. As demonstrated by the fact that we've made as much progress as we've have. Right. This is also very common in evolution denial gaps in the fossil records, the math and chemistry of carbon dating that are often called into question by denialists, the change in ideas that have happened over time as people have sort of put forward hypotheses and altered their theories and that sort of thing. These are all aspects of paleontology and like archaeology, you know, that sort of thing that are pointed toward as insurmountable flaws by mm-hmm. the denialist position when they're not like they're, you know, these are endeavors that further our understanding of history. And there's incomplete based on what we what we have so far, but we can keep filling in those flaws. And so, yeah, this actually this is the thing I was describing earlier is that yeah. while the amount of evidence is massive in favor of the scientific theories, ironically, the smallest shred of spurious evidence is more than enough evidence for the denier if it's in line with what they already believe. And that's essentially just how whataboutisms work. Well, what about this? What about this? What about this? Just asking questions is the whataboutism part of this, right? Yeah, yeah. You think you're uh, or in the moving the goalpost. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, moving the goalpost. That's what I meant. Sorry. The moving the goalpost part. So <laughs> another tactic they use is uh, semantics. And this is always a lot of fun. This is this is the kid that's like, when you do a sleepover and you're like, uh, you know, they're like, actually, it's 1201. It's tomorrow. Like, it's it's not Wednesday. It's Thursday. It's like that's yeah. the, this is this is that person that that kid grows up to be a climate denier. So what, I love that example. What, so, <laughs> so deniers will employ semantic definitional arguments to deny something that conflicts with their opinions. And what they'll do is they'll take the words science uses to describe a phenomenon and try to extrapolate that the phenomenon of interest can't be real because of the words used. So basically. Basically, they're trying to like use, you know, whatever ammo they can get from scientists against itself. Now, in the Skeptics Guidebook, they use the example of defining mental illness as a disease and that there are these people, Scientologists among them, who deny the existence of mental illness and argue instead that it is because disease is physical and that many mental health conditions do not have an objectively defined physical pathology Therefore, because they're not physical, they are not real illnesses, they are not disease, mental illness does not exist. That's sort of their logic, or if you yeah. can call that logic, that's their argument uh, that they will follow. And you'll see this too in anti-GMO groups, right? Where they like to debate terms that point to the science that's used in modifying crops as being toxic, but that the pesticides and fertilizers and chemicals to make non-GMO food is non-toxic. What does toxic mean here? Uh, stop asking hard questions. Just go over there, hang out. We don't we don't need to talk about this anymore. We've already we've already figured out that it's just not good. Yeah. So, yes, use of semantics is another tactic of the denialist is to try and point to. I mean, that's kind of like a straw man, right? It's sort of saying, oh, well, you said this. So that makes your argument invalid. I'm like, OK, can you <laughs> engage with this you know, thoughtfully or just. Okay. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> no, you cannot because you're a denialist. All right. <laughs> The next one here is the argument from ignorance, which is Mm -hmm. just as fun as it sounds. It's similar (laughs) to exaggerating the lack of certainty. It's a certain tactic of denialism is to simply exaggerate what is unknown. It's Caveman Lawyer from Saturday Night Live. Do you remember that skit? I do not, but this sounds great. So it's Phil Hartman, and he's like, I don't know your human ways. I am but a primitive caveman. And that's like how he starts all of his arguments. Yeah. And that's exactly what it is, right? So you you exaggerate that lack of certainty, which is a tactic that basically exaggerates the unknown. And we simply can't predict those individual circumstances of weather, right? Specifically, the the individual circumstances of weather with 100% accuracy. We can't do that. We just don't know enough about the complex variables that have 
affect the weather to be more accurate. We are getting more accurate as it goes, but we're just right. not quite there yet. Yeah, it's difficult. This is enough of an unknown for climate change deniers to argue that what we think about climate change can't be real. Like the just the unknown factors, the unpredictability of weather, those hundreds and thousands of variables that contribute to weather weather patterns and climate in general, that's enough for people to go, well, if it's global warming, how can it snow? Yeah. It's so cold here. It's the coldest winter on record. It's like, well, weather and climate are two different things, you dork. Uh, the evolution denialism people point to the fact that we're still unlocking important variables that explain the kinds of mutations that could have led to the vast diversity of life on the planet as being, again, like there's so much that you don't know. Like how, like how can you say anything? Cause there's this great unknown. Mm -hmm. Now the science is not wrong that the process occurred through natural selection, but they're not necessarily clear on all the details. However, deniers point to this lack of certainty as a reason to distrust the science entirely i think the anti-vax crowd does this a lot too you know yeah they're very much like what well what about the things that we don't know how this is going to affect us in 10 15 30 years i'm like okay so like really it's always a risk benefit analysis and what you're essentially right. claiming again would we go to revealing what is what is the motive what are the values that are implied by that position it's like okay so you're implying that the risk of the damage of the disease is better than the risk of the unknown that we're fair we feel fairly certain about based on the evidence that we have right exactly that makes that makes perfect sense yeah all right i'm gonna go uh consult my evolution textbook and uh be right back after these ads Well, that was a refreshing read of Origin of the Species. <laughs> Let's talk about some other tactics that uh, deniers like to use. Let's do it. One of them is scientific disagreements. And so this I, I see this a lot where they'll, yeah. you know, and this is actually this makes me think of commercials where they say, you know, four out of five dentists. It's like, I want to know what that other dentist is like upset about, about yeah. that toothpaste or that toothbrush or whatever it is, you know, like, right. I'm just curious, like, you know, who's, who's in their pocket. And we'll talk about that later too. <laughs> now, what ends up happening is if there are disagreements, deniers like to point to disagreements as a lack of consensus, meaning that all options should be on the table or at least not the option that they don't like. So they'll be like, Oh, well this article, this one article says this. So there's no agreement. So that means your evidence, your mountain of evidence is false. Right. I'm like, well, you wrote that article. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, of course, uh, bias much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the other one that you're citing doesn't say that. So I don't know what you're doing there. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, yeah, the denialists will debate that, A, there's a lot of conflicting opinions that dispute the majority, or that, B, there's no consensus at all. And they're essentially, you know, again, they're sort of mischaracterizing the situation where there is maybe some amount of disagreement. And again, science is not ever 100% certain. And they essentially point to any disagreement is like, well, throw the whole thing out. Can't possibly be right. This one person over here who's, you know, dropping acid every 30 seconds doesn't agree with the other scientists. So they're <laughs> that we need to listen to them and, and consider that everything's wrong. Right. For example, there's not agreement on the Metallica catalog of music, right? So you've got Metallica that says they wrote all their own music and Dave Mustaine, the one dissenting opinion going, no, they took my music, but he's the only person that has ever said that. And so, uh, you know, he's just basically a Metallica denier. Jeez. He's just mad now. But for a real, a real example, denying the existence of COVID-19 during the pandemic used the confusion among some of the messaging to attempt to support the idea that it wasn't real or wasn't severe or whatever it was. They basically said, oh, well, they can't eat like last week. It was this Fauci said this. So it's got so. So who are we supposed to believe? They don't even know. It's like, well, we understood more as we studied this thing more. So we updated information. But, you know, people took that and ran with it. And that actually caused a lot of problems. And it just certainly could have been a lot more clear and there could have been more consistent and, you know, easy to understand messaging. But I think the, the, the thing is we were all sort of in the midst of a crisis that, that a lot of people didn't know what to do. And so a lot of approaches were tried and that meant some not so good things, but generally the advice was intended to help the safety and well being of most people. And they use the same tactic to argue against, against masks you know, they said, well, when it first started, they said, don't wear masks. And now they're saying we do wear masks. Like, I don't know what to believe and I don't want to wear masks. So I'm not going to. Yeah. So that's sort of the logic that was employed there. And that's the exact same thing. 
And you know, what ends up happening is on top of that, sometimes people will rely on information provided by celebrities or information provided by politicians who couldn't even pass like a basic science exam. And they'll use that as their counter evidence. So for some reason, people using Ted Cruz as a a citation blows my mind. So, uh, but it happens and it happens a lot. And actually that's, that's something they'll take. It's almost like an appeal to authority where it's like, this person is, uh, is in charge of something. They are responsible. So they've got to be, they've got to know what they're talking about. Right. It'd be like, to me, citing someone like Ted Cruz is like, well, I heard it from this rock over here, so I'm going to believe the rock. You're giving too much credit to the rock. That's true. Uh, that's true. <laughs> not not Dwayne Johnson. I'm talking about a literal piece of stone. Yeah, a literal mineral buildup. Yeah, exactly. And in case it's not obvious, it's because rocks are notoriously have bad opinions. Yeah. That, yes. So far. <laughs> so far as we know. All right, let's get into another one of the tactics here. Another one is the scientific motives. And essentially, this is a strategy to appeal to conspiracies. And deniers, what they like to do is sow doubt by questioning the motives of scientists and experts. And I mean, mm-hmm. it's on the one hand, it's, it's a, it is a smart tactic because what they're trying to do is say, OK, the reason that they all agree the reason that they are coming to this conclusion that we don't like is because they are anti us. And that's sort of uh, a way that they can, once you have taken that step, virtually anything you say can seem plausible and everything that your opponent says can seem implausible and have ulterior motives. Yeah. Ultimately, this is the Andrew Wakefield argument. Yeah. Like this is exactly what he has done in all of his campaigning saying like, they're out to get me. They're, they're conspiring against me. Da, 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 da. And it's like, no, you are a shithead that shouldn't have ever been a scientist. Yeah. So what will happen is this. Uh, they'll essentially argue that the scientists are pulling the strings of society or, or being puppeted by a shadow government or a big corporation to pull the strings or something along those lines. And I just want to kind of, I want to like lay this out for a second. Like this is kind of one of those things that happens with the moon landing, Mm -hmm. right? Everybody's like the moon landing was fake. It's like, you're talking about thousands and thousands of people that have kept the lie a secret for decades. You're telling me that all these people that worked on this program were able to keep this lie or doesn't it make sense that we maybe we landed on the moon? Like, like, you know, it's like, it's like, parsimony here folks right. parsimony but that doesn't happen here scientific motives mean that like there's somebody out to get you and that's enough to sow fear and make you question all the things that you hear yeah basically they'll claim that the evidence that's available can't and shouldn't be believed because the purveyors of that evidence have the power and authority to control popular opinion Mm-hmm. And so that's essentially the line of logic that's being used here. Yeah. And unfortunately, this has happened uh, in the past, and it would be difficult to tell if it's happening now, except that we have a lot of safeguards in place to prevent that sort of thing. And uh, a million people ready to be whistleblowers if they suspect foul play. I mean, there is a history of clandestine organizations doing sketchy things like there right. is that that does exist. And so that's some of the evidence that they'll point to. They'll be like, oh, see, you can't believe them because remember MK Ultra. Right. And it's like, <laughs> wait, it's like, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. You're telling me that making you wear a mask is the equivalent of dosing water supplies with LSD and making you trip out for days just to see what would happen or the Tuskegee Airmen experiments. You think that's this is the equivalent? Get out of here. That's ridiculous. <laughs> now, again, what I think is really ironic about this is that the denialists will believe the motives of the scientists are questionable and nefarious while completely accepting the arguments of the people whose motives are usually at best opaque and at worst, (laughs) they're like trying to manipulate those people into believing what they want them to believe. And often like very thinly veil motives of financial gain or political power. It's like you're refusing to accept the words of scientists who are just trying to understand the world and often communicate policies in such a way that it will benefit humanity. And instead accepting the opinion of this big corporation who directly benefits from denying the position of scientists and instead enforcing policies that will do definitely damage the world, but will be better for their bottom line. Like their motives are clearly profit. Yeah. And we know that because they're a big corporation who has been successful at doing this sort of thing. Whereas the other people's motives are very like they do not get a payday by espousing their Mm -hmm. opinion. They just get paid for, you know, doing their job and communicating. And nevertheless, you're believing the opinions of people who's like, 
you know what their motives are and their motives are 100 percent financial they're not even trying to hide it yeah this is 100 percent cult 101 right that's literally what it is is a cult will say you got get into a secret organization we know and they don't know and people trust i mean you read stuff about cults and it's like you've got the leaders that are like taking like getting signed into people's wills absorbing their properties and becoming like incredibly rich off of stuff like this off of just sowing seeds of doubt and being like don't believe them believe us it's actually you raise a really good point which is not one of the tactics here but that is really important is that one of the tactics is to make people feel like they're on the inside of the no like they're the mm-hmm. only ones who know the truth of what's going on which is a mind bogglingly narcissistic opinion to have <laughs> yes <laughs> like yeah. oh I am the smartest person on the planet because I know this thing that the psychopath told me whoa yeah it's wild it's wild one day one day we'll do an we should do an episode on like on cults and like how they work like truly like really get into it because because of stuff like that because it's that easy like in in a lot of times deniers will find people who are vulnerable or susceptible to this type of kind of brainwashing yeah i'll leave it there i guess but let's talk (laughs) talk about our next tactic then (laughs) go for it this is this is all you All right. Another strategy denialists might use is freedom. (laughs) Uh, You all can't see it. This is an audio medium, but uh, Abraham's got half his face painted blue. (laughs) That's right. And I'm in a kilt. (laughs) And he's in a kilt, but does not agree with Prima Nocta. Fact. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Try to stop short of, you know, sexual crimes. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Most of us do. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) It's the bare minimum you can do. Matt Gates. (laughs) Got him. So anyway, freedom is a value shared by many around the globe. Obviously, we generally appreciate the idea of freedom, although it is, of course, viciously opposed in Russia. Hey-o. <laughs> this is Man, actually really just, tricky. Just hot takes. So many hot takes. There are a lot of hot takes going on today. I'm okay with it. I'm, I'm on board. <laughs> I'm fine with it. Now, this freedom one is very tricky because essentially many, many deniers essentially point to the, the idea that they should have equal space or more to share their ideas and equal platforms or more to spread their misinformation and that their ability to do this is guaranteed by the freedom provided by the government. Mm -hmm. That's essentially the position they're taking. Yeah. Essentially their claim is that they should be free to say and do as they wish, regardless of how much harm or damage it may cause to the supporters of this position, access to resources and equity among members of the society is at best a nuisance. So it gets a little bit tricky. Like you said, Um, it is difficult. Should freedom to speech be curtailed when it disagrees with the mainstream? What about when it kills 500,000 people? Now to some, there is no line. There is absolutely no line. Freedom is freedom no matter what. Yeah. And that's sort of, I think, where we just need a more nuanced conversation. Essentially, if we value freedom of speech, then we do argue that they should have the right to say whatever they want. But there's the point at which saying whatever they want is causing a lot of harm and damage and disrupting or ending people's lives. That's when it becomes a problem. And we do have laws in place to protect things like libel and slander. But that's like the damage is done at that point. Yeah. Now you're assessing the cost of those damages. We're saying maybe we shouldn't allow that to get to that point. (laughs) Right. But, you know, I guess there are definitely people who are going to take that out of context and are going to say, hey, they're saying we shouldn't have freedom of speech. And I don't think it's a black and white issue. I think that we want to talk about, like, at what point? Because, I mean, if, if you want to take that position, then by your own logic, we should be able to get on a public mainstream platform and say something completely untrue about you that destroys your life as you ruin your right. credit, get you kicked out of your house, have mobs of people going to attack you. And you'd be like, yep, that's good. I'm on, I'm in support of this. Right. Because that's essentially the logic that's being employed here. Like it goes both ways. And we're trying to say, like, maybe we should just have a conversation about like at what point like we want people to, be able to say whatever they want. And we also want to protect as many people as we can. Yeah, absolutely. What we want to, I guess, maybe unpack here is that the scientific community, unlike social media platforms and deniers, have adopted many ethical guidelines that actually establish standards, including communication standards. This is not a suppression issue. It's a quality assurance issue and an ethical scientist 
scientific practitioner will not claim that their all natural cabbage juice will cure deafness, even if they think it is extremely healthy. And that's because of these guidelines. There are protections. And I think that's a really important thing is knowing and understanding that the larger population, the majority of the population is incredibly susceptible to certain types of information. So we have to make sure that we are very careful with presenting certain types of information. Yes. All right. Well, we need to have the let the the advertisers do their thing and and have their way with you. But we'll be back to talk more about the last couple of strategies that the the deniers use Mm -hmm. and also what we can do about it. Yep. Let's get on this slippery slope. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so the slippery slope is another type of uh, strategy that they use. And some denials will argue that if the claim they don't like is true and widely adopted, then terrible things will happen. So, for example, if the Earth is spherical, then the stars and sun in the sky aren't man-made constructions meant to house the human species. And there isn't some shadowy cabal of elites controlling everything that we do. Then we are now responsible for our own actions and have been duped. Ooh, it's scary being responsible for our own stuff. Yeah. And this one's going to probably get us a few hate mails. But (laughs) if organic food is worse for the environment, a drain on resources and doesn't taste any differently and sometimes tastes worse than non-organic foods, then the big ag companies will have the free reign to exploit every last resource in their mega farms and will collapse under the weight of their own hubris. Mm, I'm waiting for those emails. Yeah. Now, if people really did land on the moon, then we are capable of so much more than we are currently demonstrating and should be doing more to help our species and our planet. And again, the government isn't controlling everything and we are responsible for our own actions, et cetera, et cetera. Etc. There are a lot of examples of this. By the way, as a quick side note, they are getting ready tomorrow at the time of this recording. They are launching the new moon program. They're launching a rocket tomorrow. Artemis. Yeah, Artemis is coming out tomorrow. So I'm really excited about that. I believe this is the unma- The first one's unmanned, right? The first one's unmanned. Yes. Cool. That's so exciting, though. Yeah, it's really it's really, really cool. I get to see it from my front yard. Oh, that's really wow. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. I see. I see all the rocket launches from my front yard. I could see them. I could see everyone go up. Wow. All right. Anyway, I think if I recall correctly, they were expecting boots on the moon in the next like five years or something like it's really soon. They're really, really close. And there's a team of behaviorists that are working with them to do that. Hey, and I know that they're planning on putting some more underrepresented people up there like women and people of color. Yeah, it's great. So I hope that that all comes to fruition and that they don't destroy our planet by dumping a ton of CO2 into the atmosphere on their way up. (laughs) Me too. I think we were talking about the purchase or hoodwink the scientists. Yes, yes. All right. So several scientists have been bought by administrations or companies to push the rhetoric. So this is kind of a Mm -hmm. thing that the denialists will do is they'll like, well, let's just hire the scientists to our side. Right. And it's kind of ironic beyond the point of comical that scientists hired by anti-GMO groups to push the agenda of their employer are seen as legitimate and not accused as being shills for their corporation. (laughs) Right. While the independent scientists and policymakers that have no personal benefit from GMOs push their safety and efficacy, and they're called shills for big agriculture. Uh, Right. It's just it's very silly. It's very silly. Like what ends up happening is that some scientists are so siloed in their own little niche. They don't know that they are being used by a denialist group. So sometimes the group is very vague about what their motives are and simply tee up the scientists to say what they want when they want them to say it. And then end up recording, edit accordingly and publish. So basically they they get hired to do this thing. They get the sound bites out of the scientist and then they say, see you later. We'll make that sound how we want it to sound. Here's your check. Bye. Uh huh. Yeah, goodbye. And interestingly, one of the tactics that they'll use is that the deniers will tell the scientist that, hey, scientist, your work is saving the world in the greatest thing since the Internet. Uh And then they flatter them and their flattery will win those scientists over to become their advocates. And they won't necessarily be very clear with the scientist about what they're advocating, but they'll have, you know, them sort of advocating on their behalf. Right. Even while they're pushing their denialist agenda. So. You know, again, they have a full arsenal here of tactics for persuading people. Yeah. And it's and it's effective. It's worked for them, unfortunately. Unfortunately. So I think that brings us to the question of what can we do about it? How do we fix this? How do we prevent denialists from taking hold and convincing everybody that the world is flat and then getting to be governor of Florida? Unfortunately, what we can do about it is little. Yeah. But I think that one of the positions we have to take to be to continue to be scientists is we can't play their game. 
And we have to consider the fact that maybe their position is right. We have to start, you know, the scientific position is maybe they're right. Now, as I've said before, usually it will take more evidence to convince me to change my opinion than it would to have formed the opinion in the first place, because now you've got to at least match the evidence, if not exceed it, for me to shift right. my position. But I'm open to considering the fact that I might be wrong about everything that I believe. That's what makes me different. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so so there's often a retort that we should fight bad speech with more speech. And it's something that we can and should do. I agree that we should be able to talk about this more and share that. And we have tried more communication in the spirit of the libertarian. But again, we're not an even playing fields. We're not even playing the same game. And so communication isn't reaching any of the followers of the deniers. What it's doing is actually adding different talking points to the denialist movement and then allowing them to punch additional holes into or try to punch additional holes into the science that's being communicated right yeah they just they just lean on another tactic like oh this one needs a, some bolstering to to make it stronger for our you know our people whatever so yeah we've tried disputing and empirically demonstrating the falsehood of the claims of pseudoscientists and i do think it's something that we should continue to do so this is another tactic of like things that we can do here is to just show scientifically why it's incorrect mm -hmm. but this has only marginally worked oftentimes not at all yeah. And deniers can come up with nonsense so much faster than it can be debunked because hawking stupid ideas is easy and disproving them is labor intensive and expensive. Yeah. Furthermore, even if science were able to keep pace with the rate of the ability to like throw out these denialist ideas, Just make stuff up. Yeah. The deniers would ignore and downplay the scientific evidence using the aforementioned tactics. Right. So it's, it's a very yeah. tricky situation to be in. You know, another thing, too, is we could try to write laws that rein in the misinformation campaigns. But the problem is we've tried legislating these people like we've tried to legislate them away. But this actually fuels the conspiracies and rallies followers behind them because they're now victimized deniers who are being silenced, albeit extremely ineffectively. That they're being silenced, but they're still being silenced. Yeah. And so by conspirators, they're saying, oh, well, you know, they're just trying to to put a clamp on their mouth. They're trying to shut them down and all that. And then this erupts into a debate about freedom, that slippery slope that we talked about before, too. Right. So like it gets into like, OK, if they can't say this, then where is their platform? What is the right? Where is the line? And that turn that's that's usually where that debate goes. So we tried the. If there's, you know, bad speech, we try to fight with more speech. That doesn't seem to be very effective because they can exist in their own little silos and they just create new talking points. We've tried demonstrating with actual evidence by disproving those claims, but it's very difficult to do and hard to keep pace because you have no criteria for hawking a conspiracy theory. You have lots of criteria mm -hmm. for proving a scientific one. Right. And we can try and legislate it away, but that, oh, it, that seems to frequently backfire and doesn't necessarily solve the problem. I think... We need to be compassionate to our fellow humans. Yeah. Despite everything, these denialists are our species. We are part of the same collective group. And let's consider the fact that we've also tried compassion. And what has happened here is that this is often mistaken to mean that deniers are at least partially correct. They're not, but it seems perceived that way when we treat them with that kind of compassion. Or mm -hmm. it can look like scientists are too weak and also therefore can't be trusted. And it implies that we should then give equal weight to their ideas when we actually shouldn't give equal weight to their ideas. Right. And so we personally think that it should go like this, right? There should be some accountability. We need accountability for people who are touting false information and really producing harmful outcomes, right? And we need to teach critical thinking. At the very least, asking the question, how do you know? Not what's the evidence, not what about this, but how do you know that? How do you have that information? And being able to back it up and answer it with true verifiable evidence now if you can be shown if it's demonstrable that you are spreading misinformation knowing it was misinformation and that spreading that misinformation has resulted in the harm of others and then knowing that you spread information that resulted in harm to others you continue to spread misinformation i and i think we would generally argue that you should be culpable for those damages mm -hmm. and in fact the courts are starting to agree yeah. with that position at least to a point Right. Case in point, Alex Jones recent. So I mean, several lawsuits, but recent yeah. payout that was demanded. This kind of accountability would help at least prevent some of the most extreme denialism and possibly slow it down altogether. And again, do so without interrupting freedoms, because we've already said many times and generally the position is agreed by most that freedom does not mean freedom to cause harm to fellow citizens.
Right. Freedom means that you get to be in control of your own life, but that you don't necessarily get to cause damage and harm to other people's lives. Man, the lines on that are murky at best, but nevertheless, <laughs> that is the, without digging into that further now, we'll say that that's the position and we agree with that. And that when you've just going back to the position here, you've disseminated misinformation been shown to be harmful with that knowledge. You continue to disseminate and misinformation that is shown to be harmful. Accountability should be held. Absolutely. 100%. Now, if we teach people to start asking the question, how do you know, and only accepting actual answers, not more rhetorical questions or vague platitudes like we talked about, and then this will provide some kind of inoculation against most misinformation campaigns. Basically just asking, show your work, show your work. That's all we're saying. Show, truly show your work, show where the evidence is, show where the evidence lies. How do you know this is true? Or how do you know the, how have you arrived at this conclusion? I think it is another way to look at that too, because asking those questions basically opens up the dialogue in a way that is going to put the onus of proof or the burden of proof on the denier instead of on the skeptic, right? Like the scientist has already done the work. The burden of proof is already there. The denialist is the one that should be showing the work and making and and doing that. And oftentimes they can't. They're using these other tactics. Yeah. And I think that it gives particularly thinking for kids of like when someone tells you something and you can ask the question, how do you know that rules out most denialist positions because they don't know. Mm -hmm. They're essentially pushing a belief that's not a knowledge component of it. And when you get to the knowledge component of it, then the denialist position fades away or I mean, it becomes less tenable, I guess, is a better way to put it. Yeah. And so, you know, for those poor kids in Florida who are being taught that there is no such thing as gay people and that there is no such thing as slavery and that there's no such thing as racism and that there is no such thing as bigotry and that the history started 3000 years ago when God spat a sun down onto, <laughs> onto the planet and and that uh-huh. there's no such thing as dinosaurs yeah that when they're told something like that they might then turn to their teacher and say how do you know that there's no such thing as mm-hmm. dinosaurs because we have these fossils and then they'll have to think well the devil put them there how do you know the devil put them there and just keep asking those questions because uh-huh. they will stop having answers because there aren't answers because they're wrong right and so that's i think at, at the very least a thing that we can guard we can use to help guard against some of the more malicious versions of this Yeah. I also have liked the argument that Jesus is like the ultimate example of like debt forgiveness. Like the human race had like an unpayable (laughs) debt in sin. So God said, okay, I'm going to give, I'm going to put it on this guy. He'll forgive all your, all your sin loans that you've got. And then, uh, and that cleared it up. So, uh, and everybody's mad about student loans right now. So (laughs) same thing. Okay. Well, let's, we've been at this for a while. Let's go ahead and hit some quick uh, take home points for both this and I think the previous episode, and then we'll transition to some recommendations. I think I would begin by saying that just to be really clear that the de- the distinction between the two is that skepticism is a system of asking questions. S- skepticism is scientific skepticism and that denialism is instead a belief in a position that is directly counter to the available evidence. And that the way that this is successful is by engaging a lot of misinformation campaigns that directly target several things about the scientific process, such as the motives of the scientists trying to over exaggerate the extent to which something is unknown. And I think also try to say that there is equal weight available or there should be equal weight given to the, the, kinds of hypotheses that could fill that unknown gap. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think my big takeaway from this is that while denialists can be frustrating, I think one of the things that you have to look at is if you treat them with compassion, like you mentioned before, and then also understand the strategies that they use, it's a little bit easier to to kind of dismantle their arguments and move forward away from that. It's very easy to get really frustrated when you hear stuff like Shaquille O'Neal giving credence to the idea that the earth is flat, you know, as somebody who is a celebrity and people listen to him. And so you think about this and you go, okay, well, that's really frustrating because we know because there's evidence to suggest otherwise, there's more evidence to suggest otherwise. And so I think as long as we go that approach of the compassion and understanding where somebody might be getting their tactics from, I think that we can kind of work towards a little bit more of a scientific skeptic community and move away from that denialism a little bit more. Awesome. I feel like my final take on point, and I feel like there's just so many we could have, but yeah. my final one that I, I think is such a valuable piece is that how do you know component, right? I think that's the, whenever we're faced with some kind of claim, wherever we're at in life, if we ask, how do you know, 
and we start asking for the evidence, then we're in a better position to evaluate the quality of that thing. But again, we've got to also be able to protect against the kinds of ridiculous answers that will sometimes come with answer the question like, oh, I know because, you know, and give some totally nonsense answer. Yeah. So being able to be on the lookout for those answers is an important part of that. You can't just ask, how do you know and expect that'll cure everything. You've also got to then do the work of like what happens when you get an answer that's totally nonsense. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I don't have any take home points beyond that. I think that there's there's a lot to unpack and I think that we could, but I think that sums it up really nicely. All right. Well, that is skepticism versus denialism. Yay. That is all we have to say about this for now. But if you have more you should definitely reach out to us and, and we'll talk more about that after we share some of our recommendations from the week. Recommendations. Recommendations. So my recommendation this week is a, I guess, kind of a record store. It's a website and the website is Dead Tank Records. So I'm not sure if I talked about them on the show before, but um, it's a friend sure. of mine. His name is Josh. We call him Dead Tank Josh. And when we were kids, he used to show up at shows with kind of like a distro, like he'd have all his CDs and all his records and stuff. And it was wow. always really cool. I'd always grab a lot of really great stuff from him. What an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super cool. So he ended up opening his own website. He was he did a record label for a little bit, but a lot of what it is is like a distribution center. So like he's got a bunch of shirts, books, different merch things, and it's all punk and hardcore related right now. For those of you who are watching, I have a shirt. It's a Ramon shirt that is a really cool one. It's for the song Pet Cemetery, And I got it from him and he does some really cool things as far as that goes. And so I, I definitely recommend checking it out, perusing a little bit. The books he has are great. They're really socially aware, usually a little bit extreme, uh, you know, on more of the anarchy leftist side of things if you're interested in that but does has some really really cool stuff available so i definitely recommend checking it out and, and seeing what he's got there and he's, he does sales all the time like every week there's like a 10 percent sale on all shirts or you know something like that he gets a bunch of new vinyl in. he just got a bunch of nirvana vinyl in and stuff like that too so he's got some really cool things wow that's awesome yeah i like it all right. Despite what I'm currently experiencing, and if you were to join us on Patreon, you'd be able to see that my image is completely frozen, mm-hmm. but my audio seems to be coming through. Despite all of that, I think I'm actually going to recommend the online conferencing platform, Zoom. <laughs> There's yes. a few reasons for this. First of all, I think it is one of the most cost-effective platforms that's available where you can actually do like large groups, you can do small groups. It's really intuitive and easy to use. And the other reason I was thinking about this is that when the pandemic first started, Everybody who could start price gouging things started price gouging things. It was like yes. every piece of technology, everything you needed, like prices went through the roof that were to support a transition to an online learning environment. Zoom made their stuff more affordable and accessible. They had their free platform. They used to have a limit for how long you could be on a meeting on their free version of the platform. And they took the limit off. Uh And so I think although Zoom has had many other issues that they've dealt with and they're not saying they're a perfect company, I do think that they are one of the better companies for an online conferencing software. And I strongly recommend them. I, I prefer to use them over virtually anything else at this point. Yeah. No, I agree. I'm there with you. I think it's fantastic. It's it's definitely less buggy than some of the other stuff I've used. Yeah. And generally less expensive. I mean, there's I mean, exactly. like Google Hangouts, I think is free. And like some of those that are that come with software platforms are free. But like before this, I was using other platforms like they were massively expensive, like hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month to use their platforms. Mm-hmm. And while they were you know, comprehensive and well put together. I mean, you just get essentially the same thing, but a lot easier to use and a lot less expensive on Zoom. So, right. Exactly. Okay. I think that's it for recommendations. If you'd like to tell us about your favorite online conferencing platform or our independent record slash merch company that is an online store you should reach out to us and if we missed anything or you'd like to add anything to our conversation about skepticism versus denialism call us out for throwing the denialists under the bus or join us in our our love of science and our our promotion of what it can do to help further the human species then you should definitely do that you can reach us directly our social media or you can email us where you'll definitely be talking to me at our email info at wwd wwdpodcast.com You can also support us by leaving us a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure you subscribe so you always catch future episodes. You can join us on Patreon where you'll get all kinds of access to perks such as videos, behind the scenes notes, 
videos of us recording our episodes specifically. Mm -hmm. You'll get early access to episodes, that sort of thing. Ad free episodes, like we record these these segues for ads, but you don't have to listen to that if you go on to Patreon. You can get the ad free versions. And also you can support us by picking up some merch by going to our store and buying like a beanie, or a water bottle, or a jacket, or yeah. a shirt, or a sticker, or all of those things together at once. And most of them will come in a gift basket type thing from Shane. Mm -hmm. And by gift basket, of course, I mean box with padding. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I think other than that, that is all I have for uh, reaching out to us. Am I missing anything there? No, I think you covered it. All right, perfect. So the people who've already joined us on Patreon and therefore are some of our favorite people includes Amanda, Brad, The Daily BA, Joshua, Justin, Justine, Kelly, Kim, Costia, Layla, Megan, Mike M, Mike T, Shauna, and Stephanie. Thank you all so, so much. And as that list grows, I've been doing an alphabetical order, but I'm kind of wondering if maybe I should do it in order in which they they became supporters, you know, that way. Just get a little seniority going, yeah. maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to throw anybody to the bus, but I also kind of like want to shout out those people who've been with us for so long. You guys are great. Yeah, I like the idea. I have a team of people without whom I would not be able to do this show. That includes Justin, Selena, Patrick, Jess, Kyle, Alan, and of course, Shane. Thank you so much for recording with me Thank and you helping for having me. With, uh, with all that stuff. So. I think that is all I have. Do you have anything else you need to throw out there before we say our goodbyes? Nothing else. Thank you all for being here. All right, then that's all I've got as well. This is Abraham. And this is Shane. We're out. See ya. You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have an awesome day.